As I said, the opening session uh, was meant to keep this uh, wide uh, perspective. And for this, we have two distinguished uh, guests. Uh, and the first uh, one is uh, Ms. Mary uh, uh, Wolick, a deputy executive director of the IEA sitting in Paris. Uh, she studied political science and law and diplomacy. She's a former career dip diplomat and a former US ambassador. Uh, she held a variety of senior leadership position in the US and the UN and globally, including as an advisor to, uh, to the US Secretary of State on energy diplomacy. Uh, I highlighted in bold some of the terms that I think are important for us in this keynote session because uh, having an ambassador and talking about diplomacy, and as we can see also the, the special prize for exceptional public service, this is aspect that probably this is our chance to discuss and relate to, and we're going to forget about this when we dive into the details. So with no uh, further delay, uh, I want to give the floor to, uh, to Mary, who will present a presentation entitled The Energy Transition in a Global Perspective. This will be followed by a second uh, uh, keynote speaker that will go zoom in from the global per perspective to a national case studies uh, in about uh, 20, 25 minutes. So Mary, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so very much, um, Dan. And let me just uh, start by saying on behalf of the IEA, I'd like to express our sincere condolences um, to you, um, to David, to all the people of Israel, um, especially all of those uh, who have lost uh, friends and loved ones over the past um, incredibly tragic days. Um, of course, we are all hoping and praying for the return of peace and security in Israel, and um, please know that we stand with you in these unprecedented um, times. Um, so much has changed since we uh, spoke just a week ago, clearly, um, but I uh, want to express my appreciation for you and, uh, and others, uh, Israeli colleagues, for being able to join us um, this way. And of course, my thanks to the Leopoldina uh, the National Academy of Sciences and, uh, and your Israeli Academy of Sciences and Humanities for the invitation to be here. I'm really pleased to be able to speak and I'll uh, hopefully build a little bit on your remarks just now. Um, so I think many of you are familiar uh, with the uh, IEA, but just to say a few words, uh, we're an intergovernmental uh, organization based in Paris. Uh, we were created in 1974. Uh, to help create a collective, um, coordinate a collective response to major disruptions in the supply of oil. So we're almost hitting our 50th anniversary. Um, we consist of 31 member countries. Um, They're all members of the OECD and also 13 what we call association countries. These are non-OECD member countries, but they are from every region of the world, uh, countries who we work with um, quite closely. Uh, very specifically on clean energy, on their clean energy um, transitions. And um, yes, while oil, oil security remains a key aspect of our work, we continue to monitor, monitor the energy markets uh, quite closely, and I'll say a few words about that in a minute. The IEA has, of course, uh, evolved significantly um, and expanded its work uh, uh, over the course of these past decades. And today, um, really, the IEA is engaged in all aspects of what we call global dialogue on energy, including the energy sector's uh, important role in addressing climate change, providing analysis, data, policy recommendations, and real-world solutions very much focused on ensuring that countries have secure and sustainable energy, but ensuring they're uh, helping to support their efforts in terms of the clean energy transition. And um, yeah, we take an all fuels, all technology approach, um, and the IEA recommends policies that enhance reliability, affordability, and sustainability of the energy system. So um, energy is, uh, is, is truly at the center of a number of today's most pressing challenges. If, uh, as you've just described, the global energy crisis following the war in Ukraine continues to impact costs for households and businesses all around the world contributing to inflation, which remains stubbornly high. And we're also acutely aware of the risks of insecure supply chains and the urgent need to diversify them. 
And this applies to oil and gas, but also to critical minerals and key manufactured components for renewables, electric vehicles, and more. And of course, um, global CO2 emissions are at a record high, um, and the worsening effects of climate change continue to press home the urgent need to reduce emissions. And this is very much a, a message in our analysis, which I'll get to a little later. While governments must continue to take urgent measures to guard against further risks to global energy security, governments are also taking important steps to address the underlying factors um, contributing to the global energy crisis. And today, um, this morning, I want to focus on three uh, key topics, uh, if you'll bear with me. First, the state, uh, briefly, of energy markets today, including some of the really important transformations we're seeing in clean energy and clean energy investments in recent years. Uh, then I'll say a few words about what's required for the world to successfully um, shift to a 1.5 degree um, trajectory um, and how to ensure a secure, just, and orderly transition to this new pathway, which is so important. Just two weeks ago, um, we released a comprehensive update of our net zero roadmap from 2021, so there's some key findings in that report as well. I'll then conclude with an overview of some of the challenges to the clean um, energy transition. In terms of the state of uh, energy markets, um, while energy prices remain high, they're coming down from the levels we've seen in 2022. Uh, global oil demand is projected to climb by 2.2 million barrels per day in 2023 to reach 101.8 million barrels per day, a new record. So despite a challenging economic environment, uh, China accounts for 70% of this growth. And the extension of output cuts by Saudi Arabia and Russia through the end of 2023 creates a significant market deficit during the second half of the year. We're keeping a close eye on this. Producers outside the alliance uh, have seen considerable expansion. Uh, for example, from January to August, non-OPEC plus uh, countries increased supply by 1.9 million barrels per day led by the United States. And natural gas markets have moved um, towards a gradual rebalancing in 2023. The steep demand reductions in Europe and mature Asian markets eased pressure on prices. European hub and Asian spot LNG prices averaged 75% and 60% below their last year's levels in 2023, respectively, although remaining well above their historical averages. Uh, we believe that global gas supplies, however, are set to remain tight in 2023, uh, subject to many uncertainties, such as adverse weather factors, lower availability of LNG, and the possibility of a further decline in Russian pipeline gas deliveries to the European Union. And the energy sector today is quite dynamic, but it wasn't always the case. Uh, um, the world wasn't investing enough in the energy sector for uh, quite some time, uh, neither in a more sustainable way of meeting rising global energy needs nor in maintaining the effective operation of the system we had. And then in 2020 came the pandemic and then the global energy crisis. And uh, for fossil fuel investment, this meant an immediate uh, slump and a fairly uncertain recovery, but we are now more or less back to where we were um, prior to COVID. But we have seen a marked shift, and this is really important in terms of clean energy investment, which is now seeing double-digit annual growth driven by favorable costs in many cases, supportive policies, and some industrial strategies being developed by some countries who are looking to position themselves in the emerging um, clean energy economy. And as a consequence, we see the world of energy changing uh, rather rapidly um, in some areas, um, owing in part to unprecedented government and industry responses to the global energy crisis. Many of these initiatives I know you're well aware of, including the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act, um, EU's Fit for 55 package, Japan's green transformation, uh, China's new clean energy targets, um, India's solar revolution, and so on. And um, so in July, uh, I'll also flag that the IEA released its latest update of our flagship tracking clean energy progress report. I know this, there's a lot of information on this particular slide, but it does show areas uh, where progress is being made in various parts of the energy system that are critical for clean energy transitions. And the assessment shows that um, 
Yeah, that, uh, that several clean energy technologies have seen uh, incredible growth in the last uh, few years. Um, electric car sales have increased by nearly 2,000% uh, since 2015 with over 25 uh, million electric cars sold over this time. Around 60% of these sales took place in just the last two years and the growth of electric cars is on track um, with, our, uh, with our net zero by um, 2050 pathway. And for solar PV, the global rate of uh, installations has also um, dramatically increased with capacity additions in uh, 2022 almost four times higher than in the year 2015. Around one third of all solar panels ever installed were installed in just the last two years. However, not all technologies have seen such progress. Um, wind is one example. You'll see uh, the, the graph here. Following a more hopeful period of falling, falling costs and rapid expansions prior to 2020, manufacturers of wind turbines have been struggling to boost production of key components amid supply chain disruptions and cost increases. And CCUS, although long seen as a promising technology, has so far underperformed uh, compared to expectations. Rather than accelerating the rate of capacity additions of new CCS plants has actually slowed down over the course of the last decade. So uh, when we uh, look at this complex um, landscape, we ask, our, ask ourselves, is it still possible to reach net zero emissions by 2050? And um, we've concluded it's a clear yes. The pathway has no doubt narrowed, but clean energy growth is um, keeping it open. And although progress across different clean technologies has been uneven, we do believe we already have uh, many of the tools we need. The key actions required to bend the emissions curve sharply downwards are well understood, cost effective in many cases, and are already being deployed at an accelerating rate. And these are ramping up uh, renewable deployment, improving energy intensity uh, improvements, including via electrification, and cutting methane emissions. In our net zero scenario, strong growth in clean energy and other policy measures together lead to annual emissions falling by nearly 40% or 12.6 gigatons by 2030. And together these uh, three actions deliver 80, over 80% of the emissions reductions needed between now and 2030. So let's look um, closer at what, at what is needed in each of these three areas. Um, we need to triple renewables capacity by 2030, reaching 11,000 gigawatts in total. This is the uh, single largest driver of emissions reduction this decade. Renewable power is widely available and it's often rapidly deployable. Solar PV and wind are also already the cheapest new sources of electricity in most markets today. And current policy settings already put advanced economies in China on track to achieve 85% of their contribution to this global goal. In other countries, however, more support is needed. Uh, the cost of capital for renewables in emerging market and developing economies is more than double what it is in advanced economies, and stronger policies and international support will be required um, to increase investor confidence and reduce project risks in these countries. Um, while global renewables capacity triples, a changing policy landscape is opening opportunities for a nuclear comeback in some cases as well. More than 30 countries which accept nuclear power today increase their use of nuclear in the net zero scenario as a means of reducing emissions and addressing um, energy security concerns. Second, i um, like to point to the rate of energy intensity improvements, uh, which we see doubling or needing to double by 2030. This is the second largest driver of emissions reductions. The improvement comes from three main levers, switching to more efficient fuels, improving efficiencies of technologies and behavioral changes. And at the global level, each lever has roughly the same importance, so each country will follow different approaches. Some countries will focus on switching to more efficient fuels. Um, in advanced economies, electrification is particularly important. 
And in developing countries, huge energy savings will come from universal access to clean cooking. And some countries will lean more on improving the technical efficiency of end-use technologies. For example, the efficiency of air conditioners improved by 40% over the last 20 years, but the ones sold today in emerging and developing countries are on average only are, are on average only half as efficient as the best available technology. And labels and standards can help to increase the market shares of more efficient appliances. And some countries may choose to promote awareness um, with regard to energy efficiency through uh, incentives that foster behavioral change, measures such as adjusting indoor temperatures for heating and cooling, or driving speeds on highways can reduce emissions by more than two gigatons in 2030. And third, our scenario sees a dramatic cut in methane from fossil fuel operations of 75% by 2030. And this is achieved mainly by a rapid and concerted effort to lower methane intensity across the fossil fuel industry, including measures to reduce flaring and venting and stop leaks. And without this effort from the fossil fuel industry to lower methane emissions, we would need to reach um, global net zero CO2 by 2045 um, to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. So this really could have huge consequences um, for equitable pa well, pathways forward. And in our view, COP28 needs to include a strong commitment from all producer economies and companies to treat methane like they do safety risks with the zero tolerance approach. A safe climate for all depends on this. Another reason, um, uh, important reason to be optimistic on the clean energy transition is progress on innovation. When we re released our net zero by 2050 scenario for the first time in 2021, we showed that almost half of the CO2 reductions in 2050 needed to come from technologies that were not, not yet on the market at that time. And this is um, not about uh, some technology miracle, it's just that some important technologies like certain battery types or clean technologies in heavy industry, shipping or aviation, were still only at demonstration or prototype stage. The IEA um, tracks the readiness of more than 550 clean energy technologies, which allows us to reflect closely on technology progress. And the good news coming from that work is that in the updated net zero scenario, the share of emissions reductions in 2050 coming from technologies under development today decreased to around 35%. And this change reflects two factors. First, um, there's been considerable progress on clean energy uh, innovation, including the commercialization of several technologies. Um, sodium iron ba ion batteries are one key example which is a technology that was at a prototype stage in 2021 and is now making its first market entry this year. And this battery chemistry does not require any critical minerals, and so this is an important step to manage the security risks of the net zero transition as well. Second, the market for clean energy technologies is changing very quickly, and so we've updated our analysis with recent investment trends and announcements from technology manufacturers and other stakeholders. But there is, of course, still much more that needs to be done to get on track uh, with net zero by 2050. And many technologies at the demonstration stage are showing encouraging results, but they require targeted support still to get into the market. And in this context, I'd like to mention, um, as some of you may know, the IEA has established a multilateral platform for countries to collaborate on technology innovation through our technology collaboration programs, or TCPs. Um, there are today 39 such programs, including end-use technologies, renewable technologies, fossil energy, and fusion power, among many others, which bring together more than 6,000 experts from academia, governments, and industry from 55 countries. Perhaps some of you are, and your colleagues are participating in them. Um, the U.S. is active in 35 of the TCPs, Germany in 23, and Israel in 9. Finally, I'd like to highlight three key upcoming challenges that the world faces as we undertake the clean energy transition and the risks we all must guard against to ensure that this transition is secure and just. And these are first, um, clean energy supply chains and critical minerals, which I've mentioned just very briefly. 
second, uh, labor and people-centered transitions, and third, investment in emerging market and developing economies, which I also touched on. Um, first, uh, clean energy supply chains and critical minerals. Um, large quantities of critical minerals and other raw materials will be needed for the development of clean energy technologies. And despite increases in recent years, the anticipated supply from the current project pipeline still falls short of the requirements in the net zero by 2050 scenario. Expanding investment in new mining and refining facilities is crucial to avoid the risk of supply shortages. Encouragingly, many countries have recently introduced new policies to boost investment in new supplies, but more needs to be done. The current supply chains of uh, clean energy technologies are highly concentrated in just a few geographies. For solar panels, wind, EV batteries, electrolyzers, and heat pumps, the three largest producer countries account for at least 70% 70, 70 of manufacturing capacity globally, with China dominant in all of them. And for critical minerals, the Democratic Republic of Congo produces over 70% of the world's cobalt, and just three countries, Australia, Chile, and China, account for more than 90% of global lithium production. Countries are seeking to, ver to diversify mineral supplies with a wave of new policies, and there's growing recognition that policy interventions are needed to ensure adequate and sustainable military supplies. Self-sufficiency is not an option, especially in the case of critical minerals, um, nor is it an economically uh, optimal approach, combination of open markets, strategic partnerships, and diversity of supply sources can deliver security, resilience, and um, sustainability. And at the same time, the emissions intensity and environmental impact of clean energy technology supply chains must also be approved, improved. And on this uh, topic, the IEA has been mandated to do a lot of work by its member states to develop recommendations to ensure availability, security, and responsible sourcing of these critical minerals. The next challenge, and I'll finish up in just a minute or two, is uh, labor and ensuring people-centered transitions. Today, around 65 million people work in energy or key energy-related sectors, such as energy efficiency and vehicle manufacturing, and half of these jobs are already focused on clean energy. And the transition towards net zero emissions will lead to a net increase of energy sector jobs. The IEA estimates that in a trajectory compatible with the net zero emission scenario, 30 million new clean energy jobs are created by 2030, while close to 13 million jobs in fossil fuel related um, industries are lost. Um, and this growth is driven mainly by clean energy jobs, in particular in renewable power generation, EV and battery production, hydrogen and critical minerals um, extraction. Though, of course, we know that these new jobs are, are not always created where jobs are lost, and this is particularly true for coal, so helping workers and communities in these affected regions um, is going to be um, really crucial as part of the, the clean energy transition and will require engagement across um, civil society, industry, government, and labor, including um, training uh, for workers. The third challenge is scaling up investment in emerging and developing economies. Um, earlier, I talked about the global shift in investment toward clean energy, showing the transition is well and truly underway, but a much faster shift is needed to get on track for net zero emissions by 2050. And an average of $10 needs to be invested in clean energy for each dollar invested in fossil fuels by 2030. Today, the ratio of investments in clean energy to fossil fuels is just 1.8 to 1, though the trend is, is positive. And most of the increase in clean uh, investment needed is in the emerging market and developing economies other than China, where it rises fivefold in the second half of the current decade compared with 2022 and more than sevenfold in the second half of the 2040s. Um, this situation is even more dramatic when considering there are over still 770 million people without access to electricity 
and 2.5 billion people without access to clean cooking um, challenges that must be addressed in order to achieve the S SDG 7 goals by 2030. And um, yeah, the cost of capital for investment in emerging and developing countries is significantly higher in many cases, two to three times higher than in vast economies. Mm -hmm. So this is um, really going to be very important to um, ensure uh, and avoid the risk of a two-speed transition. So just to close, um, we at the IEA, despite all these challenges, do remain um, optimistic uh, about the growing momentum for clean energy transitions in countries all around the world. So I'd just like to conclude with a few key milestones of our, our net zero roadmap. Uh, first, governments are rightly focused on energy security, but new long lead upstream projects will not solve the immediate concerns. Um, instead, they risk locking in emissions that could push the world over the 1.5 degrees threshold. And, um, and second, um, 2023 is the year of the global stock take under the Paris Agreement. A failure to increase ambition to 2030 would make meeting the 1.5 degree goal extremely challenging and much more um, expensive, requiring the massive deployment of carbon removal technologies that have not yet been proven at scale. And the Paris Agreement also requires countries to submit new nationally determined um, contributions in 2025, um, so two years from now for the period to 2035. And so our roadmap highlights key milestones for this year for each sector and technology. But there are also key milestones for governments. Um, by 2035, to be on track with net zero globally in 2050, our analysis shows that advanced economies need to have reduced emissions by 80% and emerging market and developing economies by 60%. So the goal for the energy sector is clear. It's, um, it's, it's ambitious. There's much to be done. Um, uh, if all of these uh, benchmarks are achieved, um, net, uh, net zero uh, emissions uh, are on track uh, to be achieved by 2050, and this would result in a huge transformation, as you'll see here, Electricity generation will be 90% renewable in our pathway, with wind and solar alone supplying 70%. Nuclear capacity doubles from today, and the energy system is much more electrified, clearly, than today, with electricity supplying more than 50% of total energy consumption. And we'll need to be able to take carbon out of the atmosphere, both for reducing remaining emissions and to supply carbon feedstock for synthetic, synthetic aviation kerosene, for example. So just in, to close, um, no question, this degree of change represents a huge challenge, but also an opportunity to achieve it. Governments will need to work together really on an urgent basis. Um, the urgency is, is really important and on an accelerated basis um, also to leave um, no one behind. So thanks very much for the time. I know you've given, I've passed along a lot of information. It's been a pleasure to be here. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Professor Schlögel is the head of the Chemical Energy Conversion and Catalysis Group in the Fritz, Fritz Haber Institute of the Max Planck Society and a professor at the Technical University of Berlin. He is president of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation and vice president of the German National Academy of Leopoldina that is partly hosting or hosting this meeting in Berlin. He received an honorary doctorate of the University of Darmstadt and the 2016 ENI Award for Research on Hydrogen and Methane from Renewable Sources that will be a major topic in the, in the meeting. In introducing both speakers, I only took some, a few examples from a very impressive CV. So, uh, you know, I really encourage you to look uh, for both for Mary and for Robert uh, if you want to see uh, really accomplished uh, uh, personalities in the energy situation. But uh, let's go on for, with the presentation and uh, uh, Professor Schlogel will present a talk on how we replace fossil by renewable energy, a German perspective on a global challenge. Robert, the floor is yours. 
Yes, good morning, everyone. I'll just wait until the slides are being presented. Um, Muss ich was tun? My cups. All right. Um, as we have heard many times, uh, we are living in quite interesting, no, not interesting, in, in very challenging times, and we have quite a few of difficult situations ahead of us. Um, I mentioned just these two. We have heard many times now about the actual situation in Israel, but we might not forget there's another hot war here, on, here in Europe. There's ongoing of a quite significant yet dimension. And we have heard also in the introductory slides that they affect, of course, us all together. And lives are lost everywhere, and we should always be aware we are sitting here in very nice and comfortable situations and discuss interesting, interesting phenomena of the far-reaching future. And not far from here, people are dying constantly. And that is a very, very frustrating and very negative view which overshadows what we are doing here today. There's another catastrophe ahead of us, and I'm not so positive possibly as the previous speaker, because um, we have seen on the, the, the slide on the right-hand side, and you have also been heard in the introduction that there's no change from COVID. And on the right-hand side, I give you the consequences of this. Um, that's the temperature distribution over the planet in, at the beginning of this year. And the this negative thing is, when you look at the scale from red to blue, it's from minus eight degrees to plus eight degrees. So the, the, we are only one degree apart from where we should be is essentially an averaging phenomenon. When you look at the, at the deviations locally, then you can see, hmm, no, yeah, there, <laughs> there are massive changes already underway. And whether we can really stop this process from going from one steady state of the planet to another one will have to be seen. So, but now go to a uh, little bit more in detail, a situation uh, where just one country is at stage. So a German perspective on a global challenge. I would like to mention at this point a recent documentary that we have issued from the National Academy that essentially addresses the pathways and the corrections that are possibly needed in the German politics to, to um, address the energy, energy challenge. Uh, you will see throughout my presentation that I have a slightly critical connotation to what's happening in Germany, uh, simply because that from a scientific point of view, I'm pretty much convinced that this is not adequate how we are proceeding here. So we begin first uh, Europe because Germany is, for me is not the right dimension. When we talk about global challenges, Europe is the right dimension, I would say. And the first slide that I want to show is something that is unfortunately sometimes forgotten. There's a very nice correlation between the economic wealth of a European country and its energy consumption. And you see very nicely that this correlation holds very clearly. That means if people tell you you want to reduce the energy system size, for example, by 30 percent, then you have to break this correlation that is not so simple. So we, we had to be careful about this. Um, the second point that I want to make is what was the progress in the, the big six of the EU in terms of energy uh, savings? These are the, the quadratic blocks and in terms of CO2 emission change. And when you look at this um, it's a more realistic picture, then you see Germany has done not so badly, but not necessarily because we are so good, but mainly because we have just outsourced a lot of our fundamental energy, uh, in industry into other countries. That is the major part why this has come down. And in all other countries, there is not so much progress. Um, so it's no surprise why the Keeling curve has no change in slope. Um, when you look at this again in a little bit more detailed numbers, then you see here, this is the participation of uh, renewable energy in the total energy consumption. And the Y scale is a little bit small. It is in percent, and it goes from 15 to 20 percent. And the red line is Germany. The blue line is the EU as a whole. So the progress is there, but it's pretty small. It's about 1 percent per year. And so it takes 100 years until this is being done. And this is in sharp contrast to what we have heard in the previous talk. So yeah, if, not there, if there are not very major changes being done, then we we will not reach it in that space. The same is, of course, when you look at the inversion of this, this is the contribution of uh, CO2 emissions. And again, you see the green line is Germany, the blue, the red line is EU. And you see the reduction of CO2 emission is also not so high because the y-axis, again, is in 1% units. 
over the last 10 years. So you see, progress is not as fast as we think. And what we have heard from what the International um, Energy Agency predicts, then we have to do something which is really, this is, there's a breaking change necessary. This is a disruptive change. If you continue as what we do now, then there is no hope. So what is the dimensions? It's always a good thing to look at the absolute numbers. How large is the German energy system? I give you here a few numbers that one, one understands this in, in details. So this is, this is nice and this is good that we have so much renewable energy in our system already in terawatt hours. But when you see what is to be done, then this is still a long way to go. Um, this is about, however you count this between, negatively I count 10%, the official figure is 20%, okay? This we can debate because there are contributions in this renewable energy con contribution like bioenergy that I think are not sustainable. And sustainable is only wind and solar, that's the only thing that is really there, and then it's only half of it. What we also see, what is planned in Germany, reduction of the total energy system size by 30%. I showed you in my first slide, I'm interested to see how can you retain the wealth of the country by reducing the total energy system by 30%. It's an interesting question. Um, maybe this is doable, but not easy. Then what we want is 900 terawatt uh, hours renewable electricity generated within Germany. Okay, that is a major task. We have now yeah, 250, and 800 terawatt hours import of hydrogen is probably needed. This is debatable, and I'll show you a few numbers in a moment. So what is critical on these things is, in my view, is not many people have been asked, is this a technical limit where we are heading, or is this also a societal limit that we are heading? Because there are people in this country, at least in Germany, who would possibly not agree that we have this growth in renewable energy installations, simply because there's a public resistance to this. Um, then there's an interesting question, how do we deal with, with volatility of the electricity grid in Germany? We have a, an excellent electricity grid at the moment that's extremely stable, but I will show you in a moment this is to a significant extent you, because we use our neighboring countries as big batteries, and of course you can do that, but if the other countries are doing the same thing, then we are running into issues. That you understand a little bit what is the distribution of energy uses. So I have given in colors the different energy sources and the different dimensions of the four typical, four typical uh, application areas. That is not something surprising, but you can also quite clearly see there's a long way to go when we hear we want to remove, for example, gas by 75% in 20 years. This is quite something to do. Uh, that is certainly not simple. The big oil factor is, of course, mobility, and here I agree, there is a significant progress with electric vehicles, and that is very positive, and I think we have to, to speed up on this range, but again here, the issue is there is a lot of subsidies in this market, and if the subsidies break down, then we can see whether the market acceleration still will hold or not. That is also something the near future will have to show. Uh, I skip this for time reasons. So what does our people think? I think that is also in many cases forgotten in these kind of debates. People are just thinking the technological aspects. Um, politics in Germany follows a concept of maximal CO2 reduction, massive electrification, and energy system reduction. That is not inconsistent with what we have heard in the previous talk. Um, the politics has also interesting priorities. Speed of CO2 reduction before cost. Deep management of the state, so this is a state-run operation essentially, and national targets are more important than international targets, and renewable energy import should be minimized. Um, this gets even more detailed when we look about how do we do this. We have a sector approach by law, which I think is very critical because energy is a system and not sectors. CO2 prices should extend through all the sectors until 2027, that is good, it's very positive. The revenue that is coming from the CO2 taxes is used for broad range of state support. That ranges from a little bit of social support to OPEC subsidies, hydrogen price subsidies, industrial investment grants, even renovation of the rail system. I think this, the whole finance is totally over, overburdened. We will not ne never see so much revenues than uh, the state has already spent or allocated for spending, and it's also an interesting thing what happens to our state budget, say, after 27. 
So what is the acceptance? The acceptance is very broad. 84% here in this, in this query of the German population supports more renewable energy. So this is it's interesting. Everybody is for it, but of course not near to where this person is living. Then the support is changing. That is very well known everywhere. So even if energy costs are increasing, then the acceptance for having even more uh, renewable energy is very positive. That is also very much in alignment with what we saw in the previous presentation. We also see this in our country. Can you switch off the microphone, please? Sorry, Grange. Okay, thanks. And thirdly, I think that is also interesting. Um, in particular, in Germany, wind energy is a big issue when it comes to population, and even there, one sees there's a, a strong positive support even for wind energy. This is now an average positive view, and I think the energy transition in Germany in the population is deeply positively enshrined, and we have a strong support for this, which is good, but the government tries hard to reduce this support uh, by just uh, putting strange laws into operation that essentially disallow the individual person to take decisions on what kind of energy should be used for what purpose. And that is a critical thing that we have in our country. So volatility is an interesting thing. So that is an annual map of last year um, where you see on the y-axis the hours of the day and on the x-axis the days of the year. And the color code tells you how much renewable energy is in there. And the red is more than 20, 75% and blue is less than 25%. And you see we are still quite far away from having something that is even, evened out. So this volatility problem is massive, um, also in, even in our country. How is being solved? We can see this here. I mentioned this. The, the purple line that you see at the bottom is the international battery system. So we just import this at the moment. In the last half year, we exported it because there we had too much wind energy in the system. And so this is a very nice fluctuation. And of course, on average, this is almost zero. But in every millisecond where you have to stabilize the grid, it is far from zero. And the whole system would not function in Germany anymore if we wouldn't have this international battery system. So I think we should very clearly be sure that this is a critical problem that we have to solve. Uh, and of course, you see also the, country, the, neg the very volatile contribution of, of uh, renewables that is well known. We don't have to go into detail. I, I think it's only pictorial that you can see we are far away from having, having a situation where we can stabilize or run our electricity system at the size where we have it now. And the planning is to make it twice as big as it is now in 10, 15 years from now, which of course also doubles this problem. I skipped this too. So from diagnosis to therapy, so what are we going to do? What we have to do is, of course, it's very well known, and it has been also said before, we have two parts of our energy system, or two legs. This is the electronic part in red, where we use just three electrons that are generated locally, instantaneously. And then there's the storage part, um, and this is chemistry. I have not put the batteries specifically in there simply because they're also chemical. Um, it's a different form of chemistry than, than we are using, but it's still chemistry. So the, the energy system of the future will not be able to work without the yellow part. And the yellow part is, I think, grossly underrepresented both with respect to research, but also with the necessity that you need in order to implement it here. I have written here, it works only as a global concept because we will have global markets for the yellow part. And the strong European component helps the resilience. And we have in, in Europe, in particular in Spain, we have enormous possibilities to do something. And this is at the moment not developed in a way that I would say this is, this is suitable or is acceptable. So why would we use hydrogen or not hydrogen? This is the issue about derivatives. What I have given you in numbers here is the amount of hydrogen that is in, in kilograms that is in one cubic meter of the storage device. And you see, hydrogen, of course, itself is the worst energy carrier that you can think of. So every derivative does this better. And the best, of course, of all is ammonia. Uh, that is also one of the reasons why ammonia is so important at the moment. Okay, we think ammonia is a good choice. Then we have an ammonia value chain or transport chain that is indicated here. All the elements for this ammonia value chain, they exist on large-scale industrial implementation. So we could do this simply as it is now. So there is no fundamental necessity to develop any of these components that we do not have yet. The worst of it is the ammonia splitting part because that is not very well researched, but we have an intermediate solution for that. 
Why is this important? Because we have a trilateral symposium here, and you see the cost of hydrogen generation is here given in a color code, um, thanks to the organization where the previous presentation was from. And we see very clearly that there is this very nice cheap belt on the planet where you can do this, and there are areas where it is not so useful to do that. And unfortunately, most of Europe is in that part where it's not so orange. Um, so that means, US is fine, Israel is excellent, but the European countries are not so excellent. So we have a little bit of wind, that is fine, but I think Europe will be one of the core parts in the world where there's an enormous import of hydrogen and hydrogen derivatives necessary with respect to other parts of the world where this is maybe not so necessary. Again, this underlines that the situation, how the energy challenge must be met, will be very different in different parts of the world. So I skipped this too. This is a little bit more deep dive in an energy system, and you see this is quite more complicated when you come when it comes down now to, to, to the reality. What I want to highlight you here, I have no time to go into that in detail, but what I want to highlight is that also in the near future, that I would say in the next 30 years, I'm sure that fossil energy carriers will still have a place to go. I do not think that all fossil carriers will disappear in the next 30 years for many reasons that we can debate. So what is the global development of this new hydrogen derivatives or hydrogen itself? That's also a very nice map. The white spots are exporters of hydrogen and derivatives and the black spots are importers. And one can see that there is a global network it developing. This is a global market that is coming and this is irrespective of whether Germany finds this great or not great. So it will just happen. Um, we have done in a project together with Akatech and the German Industry Association some cost estimates how expensive is this hydrogen that we are actually sending around. And the bottom line is, is about six euro per kilogram. That is to be compared with about, say, the, what we get from methane steam reforming, which is possibly more in the area of two euros per kilogram. So there is there's a significant price gap. Also, we were very conservative with these estimates because we had carbon capture and utilization and all that included, and also the, the removal of the CO2 from the transport, that is all included. So it's really, this is all, all, you, all you need. This is not just the little bit that is necessary uh, for a part of the whole cycle. Anyway, that is a about the cost margin where we are. And when you compare this to the cost of the most critical device, this is the hydrogen generation, electrolysis, then one sees quite clearly, yeah, this is possibly feasible in some areas of the world. The critical factor is, of course, the energy cost. This is clear. We all know that. And this is why bringing down the energy cost is the most important contribution that you have. All the other things are nice. They are important, but they are not so critical. And that has been also done by international uh, energy agency quite nicely. Ammonia production in China has been uh, studied. Where is this in China? And what are the different cost contributions to that? And again, you see, of course, green and, uh, and yellow is the energy part. Then the electrolyzer is the dark green part. And the, the ammonia synthesis part is the small thing that is on top of it. The difference between advanced and standard is, can you operate an ammonia synthesis plant um, under variable load, or do you have to run it steady state? And we have no ammonia synthesis plant in that world that runs under, different, under variable load. So this is a point where we see very clearly why science and even fundamental science is very important, because there is no fundamental scientific reason why variable load should not be possible. But go and try it. We tried it, and we see very quickly what you, what you pay for that is lifetime of the system. So this is a critical problem that we, where we really see that we have fundamental issues to understand. I skip this too. Dimensions of use, we can leave this because that will come later in the presentations. We have essentially two sources for hydrogen, so there are some not so important ones. This is, of course, steam reforming today, and that sets also the CO2 limit to about 10 to 15 tons per ton hydrogen. And there's, of course, water splitting. Water splitting is not zero tons at least CO2 emission, at least not in the next 30 years. So we have estimated it to two to four tons per ton of hydrogen. It's a significant reduction, but it's not zero. And then, of course, there are fancy things, pyrolysis and dehydrogenation, and, but that will not make any contribution on the scale that we are interested in. This is for local things fine. It's also for chemical industry fine, possibly even for BSF, but certainly not for the world. Now, how much of this we will need? I show you here a, a meta-study of studies. 
And the meta study of studies tells you we need essentially no hydrogen at the bottom line and we need 700 terawatt hours at the top line and there are new studies that say even that is not enough, you need even more than this. And so that it gives you a very nice indication what is the value of studies. You can choose from whatever you want. The bottom line of this is you need a lot of hydrogen. I think that's the safe thing to conclude. And to put this in numbers again, I show you here uh, just that we get some correlation. We heard yesterday we should have the scale in mind. Yes, we do. So the European energy consumption, and then I translate this in megatons of hydrogen. We heard megatons are important. Yes, the total energy consumption that we have today, if we would do this in hydrogen, it would require 300 megatons of hydrogen. This is times eight. Then you know how many megatons in ammonia that is. So in the production of ammonia in the world is 150 megatons at the moment. You get the dimensions right. And then when you break this down to Germany, then we come down anything between 10 and 20 million tons of hydrogen per year is what we likely what we will need. This is the, the proper dimension. This is still a lot because that's about the world production of ammonia that we have at the moment. It's only the import of energy vectors that we need for Germany. The dimension, this is what we wanted to discuss. So, how big is this? This is a very nice photovoltaic plant, unfortunately in China. It's the biggest at the moment, that has about two gigawatts. So, okay, it exists, yes, we can do this big, and this is doable. That's a real electrolyzer. Um, Mr. Oles will know this electrolyzer very well. Um, again, you see the dimensions of one of these electrodes. This is one electrode, and there are hundreds of them. So, this is a quite complicated and pretty big operation when you see it live, not in the lab with these little things. Um, you will hear more about this. This is our version when they take the hydrogen and take CO2 and want to make some, some CCU out of this. This is our test facility and I don't know whether Mr. Ullis will also refer to this again. This is where we are at the moment and again that you see the dimensions. I have given you here now the electricity in megawatts that you use for electrolyzer, and then you want to make hydrogen, you want to convert it into methanol, and then you see how much methanol you get out of this. And you see how far are we away. At the moment, we are in the demonstration stage. This is any, anything that we find at the, in the world at the moment. So we are far away from reality. And then we hear we need hundreds of megatons of this. This means thousands of plants of these dimensions. This is what we really need. And then this is a long way to go, I think. So even in Germany, we would need maybe 50 of these world-scale plants in addition to what we have already. So I'm almost done. One thing is, if you use methanol, this is nice because it is a very versatile chemical. You can do many different things with methanol, but it has a carbon atom in it. And I said yesterday already we have to be careful whether do we decarbonize the world or do we defossilize the world. And I think we will have to defossilize the world, not decarbonize. That's the German CO2 emission profile at the moment. And you see quite clearly the, the thing that makes a significant problem to me is process heat. So this is this dark red section because that is something that's very difficult to, de to defossilize. Uh, at the moment, everybody says, yeah, we make electrical reactors in chemical industry, but there are representatives from chemical industry here that can tell you how easy that is to replace this by electrical heating. It's not so simple. Um, what's also interesting is that in Germany, we have a huge debate about m the mobility CO2 emission from air traffic. And then we can ask the question, is this really our most important issue that we have to solve? This is also a debatable problem. We have Flugscham. Um, what we have to do maybe more realistically is this. So we have to capture CO2, and CO2 capture is still a significant problem. Then we have red green hydrogen, yes. Then we can do electrical thermocatalytic reduction to methanol and other transportation derivatives. Then we have a chemical plant that does all these fancy reactions that I have indicated here. It's all detail, you don't need to, to remember this. And in the end you burn all the stuff and then you have to recapture the CO2, that is the carbon cycle. There's nothing fancy because Mother Nature is doing the same. So while we are sitting here, we are burning quite a bit of carbon every moment here. And then what happens to the CO2, it goes outside to the room and there are green leaves and they recapture this. And then we eat the, re the revenue that comes from these from this green leaves and that's exactly that cycle. The efficiency of that cycle is round trip 1%. 
But it works at a very large scale, and it works automatically, and it works without platinum, and it works without high pressure. It's a fantastic operation. So our round-trip efficiency is maybe 10 times larger, but it needs all these minerals, what we have heard before, and all the high-tech operation, and this is the price that we pay that we are more efficient, but we've got to do it. And at the moment, I doubt whether we can really do it, because again, if you break this down a little bit more, then you see we have three cycles. We start with CO2, we have this, this plant that is called Sasfinery. This is an interesting word for sustainable refinery that takes a lot of hydrogen in order to generate its energy needs. And then it has three cycles. It makes polymers that are being burned. It makes chemicals and fertilizers that are being burned. And that is a simple to control cycle because the waste incineration plant is the place where it can capture the CO2. But it makes also e-fuels, and that's a more difficult thing because this is distributed. And then you need direct air capture. And we have heard also in the previous talk, one 1.7 gigatons of direct air capture are foreseen. Ah, it's enormous. This is 400 ppm of concentration. You can easily con calculate how much air you have to move in order to capture 1.7 gigatons of CO2 at 400 ppm concentration. That is enormous. And then we have, of course, the problem that we have steel and cement. Steel, we will hear, possibly that works without CO2 emission. Also, I'm skeptical there too. We can discuss this. But cement definitely works not without CO2 emission, so we have to have something that I call C-dump. Some people think this is CCS, but CCS is, I think this is a not sustainable solution, so we have to think about something else, and the other solution is, of course, to use this carbon not in CCU, because the cycle tells you the cycle would always grow and blow up itself, that it's not possible, so we have to really reform carbon that we took out the last 150 years from the soil and possibly dump it there again. That's completely possible, but it's also this is a quite challenging thing where much of research is still missing. So, previous last slide. If you want to do this, there is also a very significant problem with infrastructure, and this is not a challenge, this is a problem. Simply because there are fancy players in this area, in the political part, that are not necessarily interested in making the best possible grid in Germany, but they are interested in, in say, continuing the value of their assets, and that is not the same thing necessarily. I don't know what, how this is in other countries, but in Germany this is a very significant contribution to the discussion. Now we have a so-called hydrogen starting grid. The map is essentially shown here. And this hydrogen starting grid is designed in such a way that it serves certain purposes. And what this FNB gas, um, which is an interesting company, um, what they have suggested is these kind of uses with these time scales. And you see, only chemical industry is essentially using this. They anticipate there will be no more refineries in Germany. There is a certain contribution to hydrogen, and there is no contribution of hydrogen for uh, volatile electricity generation, and there is no hydrogen contribution for heat generation. And I think that is pretty unrealistic. Um, I have also said this here. Most of these green lines are existing gas lines. Only the dotted lines that you barely can't, can see, they have to be, should be built new. Um, and of course, they also know that this is not sufficient in Germany, so they say in their political statement, we need additional import of ammonia and other derivatives, but not from them, which is also an interesting way how you plan a gas grid or a hydrogen grid. And again, I was told dimensions. Here you see such pipes. This is not small pipes. This is pretty big. What is being to be put underground, this is what they are planning for at the moment. And this is all nickel steel, so we heard about critical elements. So there is quite a, lit, quite a bit of critical material in there. It's not iron, these things that you see there. Last slide. Energy research. We are here, we are all scientists, and we should briefly discuss what are we doing in energy research. And that is very richly structured in Germany, way different from what politics in implementation does. You see here a, a list of focal areas of energy research in Germany, and this is an incomplete list. That is only the one that is mentioned by a national plan of energy research in Germany. And I have given you that they understand what the focal areas are. The million euros support for one year, for the year 21. And then you can see this is enormous, this 1.5 billion euros in total because about half of this in addition has to come from private industry. So this is quite a substantial support for energy research. One cannot say that we are not supporting energy research. And it's also very broadly based. 
Where is this? That is another very positive thing in Germany. This is essentially all over the place. So every dot is a large-scale project that you find, and you can very nicely see that this is highly distributed in Germany, and this is not just one or two centers where energy research is being done, but the total energy infra the research infrastructure in Germany is really concerned with doing something for energy. I think one can clearly say this. This is very broad-based in our country. Okay, that was it from my, my side. Albert Einstein said very nicely, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. Um, if we would do that, I think we would do us all a little favor. Thanks so much. Well, I thought to, uh, to, to, to use this discussion period uh, by posing uh, the three questions that you see on the, on the screen. Of course, uh, this is not a very strict uh, uh, limitation. We can, uh, <coughs> we can uh, go out of these uh, questions to other uh, issues. But uh, I thought to, uh, to start with, uh, is to take advantage uh, of the fact that we have uh, Mary and uh, a diplomat and someone who is not uh, deep into the science of uh, energy solution and discuss a little bit uh, yeah, what is the role of diplomacy, policy, public support in speeding up the development of energy solution? Uh, especially, I think uh, this came up uh, in, uh, in the global presentation about the distribution of mineral and key elements that are required to develop a solution for, for, for energy. Uh, and uh, obviously, there are political complication that require diplomacy and management and uh, government involvement. So that, that might be interesting to, to include in the discussion. Uh, the other question is, uh, is uh, we are a trilateral uh, meeting and we heard the uh, global perspective and a zoom in to one of the trilateral components in Germany which is not uh, maybe the typical case for the rest of the world. So it might be interesting to discuss a little bit uh, what is the implication of, uh, of, of the differences in different regions and especially in the trilateral uh, components of, of, of this meeting, uh, United States, Europe, and, and Israel. And the last one, if we get to this, is that uh, we tend in these meetings to highlight the, the, the big achievement, uh, the, big, uh, the, the big progress that we make and all the wonderful innovations. But uh, it might be good also to spend a few minutes uh, to highlight uh, uh, the more problematic issue, the less positive aspects and uh, how we can deal with them. I think uh, Robert mentioned uh, one of them, uh, the scalability is uh, enormous and we have uh, very good plans, but to put them into action is not so uh, simple. So I think I, I would stop here and uh, we'll see if we can go through this. And of course, uh, the speakers can introduce other urgent things. If we manage to do this efficiently, then maybe we can leave a few moments for question from the, from the floor. So maybe, uh, Mary, uh, you want to start the discussion and uh, maybe start with the first uh, bullet points? Um, yes, sure, happy to do so. And um, I think I touched on it a little bit in my um, remarks, but um, there's no question that um, international cooperation, including especially among organizations such as yourselves gathered here today, um, scientists, uh, industry, and so on are going to be really important for the development of the uh, re remaining um, innovation and technology challenges um, that uh, we're facing as far as the, the clean energy transition goes. I know you're going to be doing deep dives on, on many of these, uh, in many of these areas, and I'm sorry I'm going to miss uh, some of those discussions, but, um, you know, we, we agree that uh, technologies such as, you know, CCS or CCUS along with um, hydrogen and um, biofuels and so on, uh, development of aviation fuels and such are going to be really important um, to achieve, you know, 2030 and 2050 net zero goals, decarbonization across um, hard-to-abate industries um, and so on. So, um, 
putting our heads together, um, as I said, through our technology collaboration platforms at the IEA, through meetings such as this, and I'll just mention with our 50th anniversary of the IEA coming up uh, next year, um, we're going to be hosting uh, almost certainly a, a specific innovation, clean energy innovation forum to look um, a little more deeply at these issues with both the uh, your research and, um, and industry um, communities. So lots of challenges lie ahead, no question that global um, and international cooperation is key. And then in terms of our engagement with uh, countries across the world, I touched on some of the particular challenges for emerging and developing countries when it comes to um, the investment gap, when it comes to you know, the remaining huge challenges with regard to clean energy access, clean cooking, and so on. Um, but we've been quite deeply engaged with quite a number of our of non-member countries, including th um, the 13 what we call association countries that I mentioned, on, on, um, on, on cooperating with them on the policies and measures um, that they that need to be put in place, that they want to put in place to accelerate the clean energy transition. Now, this is, um, we recognize too, though, that you know, countries in, in, in those parts of the world, in many parts of the world, Sub-Saharan Africa in particular, will all have different starting points. And this is something that uh, we hear, um, I heard recently at an event um, in, in Asia hosted by the Japanese. Um, and, and so, and that, this, that means that this whole transition period will take different, uh, different lengths of time. Um, but at the same time, I think it's encouraging to see the number of countries who are s signing up to not only more ambitious nationally determined contributions when you look at the, 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 um, the COP goals, um, but um, at, at net zero goals. Not everyone is, uh, is, is on, on line with necessarily net zero by 2050. Some are longer than that. We did a report with Indonesia last year um, their current um, goal is 2060. Um, on the other hand, we've also been doing work quite recently with Ukraine. If you can imagine in the midst of an ongoing war there, of course, they're focused um, most immediately on just keeping um, the energy systems, uh, power systems up and running. But as they look ahead to their future, they too have, uh, have uh, identified net zero by 2050 and the creation of a uh, a more secure and resilient and cleaner energy system is their goal um, as well. So um, there's there's no question. There's um, I think a growing consensus, uh, um, really globally across the world. Um, you know, with respect to the importance of the clean energy transition, the need for it, and um, and the question of um, of international collaboration with all of our partners. Uh, in finding ways to help them put the policies in place, attract the investment that's going to be important, and, um, and the investment in, the, in new technologies uh, as well is, uh, is very much needed. So I'll leave it at there for now. Thank you. Um, uh, Robert, would you like to, to add to this? Yes, of course. Thanks. Uh, first, of course, I, I fully agree with everything that has been said. I would have possibly used a few other words, but saying the same thing. So, so I, I despair you from wasting the time. I would like to highlight a, a couple of things. First, it is extremely important that we have organizations like the International Energy Agency, because this is a supranational, independent organization that always keeps us the mirror ahead of us, where we are and what are the proper numbers, where do we really stand, where, what are the quantitative underlying uh, numbers that we have, how far did we progress in this, and without this kind of mirror function, we would be probably lost because everybody would do whatever they feel is appropriate or not. So that's extremely important, and this alone is a very strong argument that we have this international collaboration or cooperation, because otherwise we, we cannot judge where we are. Um, the second point that I would like to mention is, and I only touched this a little bit, many people think the energy transition is only a matter of implementation. That is probably not correct. There is still an enormous amount of research and science to be done, and I was a little bit puzzled by these slides that we saw before where we said more than 50% of all the technologies are matured. Uh, I'm not so sure about that. Um, in particular, not when it comes to global scale operation of these technologies. Technologies. This is, this is. I'm myself involved in some of this technology development, and I can tell you, the hard part comes with the scale up. So this is why we we heard 
it already yesterday, and I have to mention this. This is one thing to have one unit operating. It's another thing to have thousands of these units operating. This is not the same issue. And that is important. And the third one is, was already mentioned by, uh, uh, by Mary, and I would also highlight this. This is the material science aspect of it. This is not only the science, it is also the availability of these things. And we, I said it yesterday, we do need recycling in the best possible way. We, we cannot just believe that we, we increase our mining capacity essentially to infinity. That will not work. Um, so we will need to think also when we design technologies that we can recycle the material. And this is in some cases easier than in others. Again, when it comes to details, we talk about purity of materials. And that's a good reason why for critical applications we tend to use fresh materials rather than recycled ones. Because to really look into the scientific aspects of recycling, where you really want to regain the quality of what you had when you had a fresh material, that's still a long way to go. This is this little details with lots of fundamental issues. And the last thing of a technology that is also not mentioned very much in this context is, of course, we need a lot of chemical transformation. Somebody said we cannot generate energy. No, we can only transform it. And um, the energy transformation is to a very significant extent chemistry. And the most important technology that we have in order to do chemistry is catalysis. And catalysis is unfortunately a very old technology, but it's not very well rested in fundamental understanding. So much of it is still empirical, and we do not have, for example, a closed theory of catalysis here. It is not possible to take a computer program and say, I have this chemical reaction computer, tell me what should I do. That is not possible. We can do this in semiconductor science, for example. You can do automatic designs of semiconductor devices, but you could not do automatic design of chemical reactions. That is impossible for very fundamental reasons. Again, my plea is, it's not only execution, it is not only money, it is not only not even the mindset is there in many cases. There is still a lot of science to be done that is usually just a little bit carried away. And that is critical because if we don't understand this, then we lose a lot of time if we do not do the research now, even, for example, direct air capture is something that we don't need today, but we need it maybe 20 years. And from now to 20 years, this is, in terms of science, nothing. So this, this is already today. And in this way, a little bit of a foresightful planning of what kind of knowledge do we need in the next 20 years in order to scale up what we have heard in the first talk would be very important. And I. I dare to address, maybe this is one of the outcomes also of this meeting, that we have possibly a list of such things what we have to do. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Professor Schlegel. Um, then just a short info. We should start with the next session at 10.45. This is 11.45 uh, Jerusalem time. And uh, we have one uh, word here from Granger. Um, if there is someone else, please, please show a sign and please keep your interventions compact. Thank you. Yes, I'll be very brief to try to help get us back on track. Uh, Ambassador Warlock, I'd like to add one additional critical challenge to your list of challenges. In most of the world today, for most industrial sectors or other uh, economics activities, there is neither a legal uh, constraint on, emission, on emissions of greenhouse gases or any associated cost. Until those two things, until that happens, none of these wonderful things we've been hearing about are going to take place at scale. We've got to figure out some way to get legal constraints or co substantial costs associated with emissions. And so I would add that to your list of challenges. Uh, Ted, please. Um, both uh, Mary and Robert referenced CCUS. In the case of Mary, it was that it had sort of failed to scale the way we had hoped. And in Robert's case, it was that there were problems unsolved in, I think, the capture side. I thought I'd just ask each of you to elaborate just a bit more on CCUS or CCS from your perspective. Mary. I'd just like to make the general point in partly responding to your question, <clears throat> but in also uh, response to Robert's um, comment. Don't, please don't misunderstand. We do not underestimate the technology challenges uh, that, that remain um, still. Um, 
the statistics, the statistic that we um, are using currently is that 35% of the technologies needed to achieve net zero goals are not yet commercially available. That doesn't mean that we're on track with respect to investments in all of these areas. Quite the contrary. We've heard so much, there's so much growing interest, as you've noted, with respect to hydrogen from countries all around the world, really. And there's a fair bit of growing interest in CCUS as well. But there are many more projects that have been announced than have actually been implemented uh, that have not yet reached FID, uh, final investment decision. And so we need to be uh, aware, uh, really, really mindful of that and really, I think, um, look even more deeply at the questions of why not, right? Uh, markets are not yet, in some cases, fully developed the way they need to be, and so on. So, um, and I really do not want to underestimate either the, um, you know, investment and financing challenges that we um, see ahead. I'm going to mention a couple more um, statistics here in that regard. I know for uh, example, on clean energy investment, which I touched on, we are estimating that uh, in 2023 there'll be something on the order of 1.8 trillion U.S. dollars invested in a whole range of clean energy technologies. Um, by 2030, by the early by by 2030, we this needs to be at a scale of 4.8 trillion per year to achieve our net zero goals. And I know you're going to be talking about electricity transmission and grids. Similarly, there are huge, huge issues to be dealing with and thinking about, I'm sure, on the technology and innovation side as well as in terms of scaling up. Um, we're estimating that uh, uh, by, around uh, by 2030, uh, uh, we will need more than uh, 2 million uh, kilometers uh, of new uh, infrastructure being invested, uh, a huge amount, if you, if you think just strictly in those terms, among other things, to say nothing of the security challenges um, in the system as well. So um, I just wanted to, to, to respond a little bit on, on those points and um, to say yes, um, you know, very much look forward to, to working with um, all of you on these remaining challenges. Thank you, Mary. Deepak, you have your word. Please turn off the microphone. Yeah. Sorry, uh, you just, you uh, you mentioned uh, briefly about the grid. I think you know the grid stands between thousands of gigawatts of generation and thousands of gigawatts of new loads, uh, and I don't think we are moving at the pace that is required out there. So this could become a really major uh, major challenge, and I just want to kind of make sure that we recognize that. Just to say, we have a new grids report coming out next year, next week. So hopefully, it will address some of these issues. Thank you. Uh, Robert Schlögel has a. Short comment. Yeah, I was asked to comment on the CO2 capture issue, so I just go back to Ted's question. Um, I have two points here to make. There is, I mentioned this specifically in direct air capture because direct air capture is Climbworks and others, but that is not sustainable and that is not scalable. Um, there's a lot of chemistry behind this because you're not only absorbing CO2, you're absorbing water, and you do this in the presence of oxygen. And when you use organic basis for that, then you will see that there's a parallel parasitic reaction of polymerization of organic basis. And this leads to a very rapid decrease of the efficiency of such processes. When you do this in, in contexts of cleaning natural gas, where we have the most experience in, in collecting CO2, then you do this in order to dump the CO2, and you don't care what is the purity of that CO2. But when you do this in order to do CCU, then you do care a lot about what is the purity of CCU. And for example, for methanol synthesis, you need to clean the gas into the PPB level in order to have sustained uh, activity. That means this is all possible, and we have demonstrated this is possible, but it's an enormous cost. That means when you want to do the economically viable form of this, then we have to worry a lot about the ways how we we actually capture our CO2 in such a way that it is suitable for CCU. In CCS, that's a different thing, and as I direct, direct air capture in gigatons will not happen with organic basis. Definitely not. Thank you. One last comment. If not, I will give the word to Dan Yakir for the closing words for this session. Okay, so somehow we managed to have a little bit of discussion and uh, 
uh, room for comments from the floor, which is great. I wish we had more time for discussion. Uh, I'm sure there will be during the two days. But I want to thank the two speakers for, for really, uh, I think, an excellent introduction to the meeting, uh, giving us a, a both a global and national uh, perspective. Um, I do encourage uh, you to discuss, uh, especially with Mary, as long as she's there, uh, some of the diplomatic aspects that we try to ignore. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, Robert uh, emphasized the challenge of scalability and uh, the challenge of building a, a big enough plant, but uh, Mary emphasized that this also depends on the availability of materials and uh, uh, key uh, uh, minerals. And this will require interactions, not only on the scientific level, but also on the diplomatic level. And that's something that we tend to forget uh, in addition to, of course, regulations and other topics that came up. So I hope uh, this will give uh, 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 a good uh, topic for discussions to the scientists, uh, in addition to diving into the technolo te technological aspects. And I wish all of us a, a great meeting. And thank you for inviting me to take part of this. Uh, especially online under this difficult uh, situation. So good luck with the meeting and thank you for coming.